Hello and welcome to day three of the second annual iHeart Pluto Festival. Uh, my name is Kevin Schindler and I'm the historian here at Lowell Observatory. And tonight I'm in Clyde Tombaugh's apartment, which is where he was living when he discovered Pluto in 1930. And actually, I'm not, we're not quite sure if this was the exact room or another one, but um, we maintain this space as an apartment for visitors. And so we call it the Tombaugh apartment. So, you know, this is just really spectacular. I can look out the windows right now, it's still daylight here in Flagstaff. And I can see the Pluto walk as it's called, um, a scale model of the solar system that goes up to Pluto. Um, right below me is Clyde Tombaugh's office. Um, and, you know, Lowell Observatory is just oozing with Pluto. Um, and so that's what we're gonna do tonight um, with our program. We're gonna kind of look at all the, all the Pluto related stuff here at Lowell Observatory. We're gonna do this with um, some recorded tours that, that several of our educators, um, that several of our educators recorded over the last couple of weeks um, because some of the spots um, don't have very good signal, Wi-Fi signal, so we just recorded these ahead of time. So we'll play three different videos that show some different aspects of Lowell Observatory and particularly Pluto. Um, and before I talk any more about I Heart Pluto, before we get started, I wanted to, to welcome um, our educators that are gonna be with us. Um, you'll see them giving the tour and, and then afterwards they'll join us for um, some questions and also discussion. Um, so Kendall Edwards, Anna Zygo, Ariel Daniel, and Catherine is also with us. Um, so we'll be uh, here throughout the, this session. Um, so if you have questions as this goes on, just send them in via YouTube and we'll get those answered. Um, some during mostly um, after the program's over. Um, but before we get started with that, you know, why are we even here? And um, we're celebrating the, the scientific and cultural heritage of Pluto. Um, February 18th, 1930 is the date that Clyde Tomba discovered Pluto. Um, and so we're coming up on the 91st anniversary. And, and Pluto is such a special thing because it's not only important scientifically, but culturally. And Northern Arizona um, kind of thinks of itself as the home of Pluto um, because it was just discovered, you know, here at the observatory, but also there's so many ties to the local community um, from early searches to the discovery to later research. Um, most of the major um, discoveries relating to Pluto and its body of moons have ties to Flagstaff. And in fact, if you tune in again on the 18th, um, the anniversary of Discovery Night, we're going to retrace Clyde Tombaugh's footsteps the day he did the discovery. Um, so we'll not only be up here at Lowell, but also around um, downtown. So this is why we're holding this iHeart Pluto Festival. It's the second annual one. We'll be holding it every year um, leading up to the 100th anniversary in, in 2030, the 100th anniversary of Pluto's um, discovery. Um, and we have these programs going on every night. Um, through the 18th this year. We also have some ongoing programs uh, that continue all the time. We have um, Karma Sushi Bar Grill, downtown Flagstaff. That's where Clyde Tombaugh ate the day he discovered Pluto, although it wasn't a sushi place back then, it was called the Black Cat Cafe. But Karma Sushi honors that heritage with the Pluto roll. So throughout the festival, if you're in Flagstaff, you can get a Pluto roll from Karma Sushi. And we also have our friends with the local amateur radio group that's operating um, right out of our parking lot, actually. Um, and we also have an art exhibit. Members of the International Association of Astronomical Artists um, have a Pluto-themed art exhibit um, that is, um, you can view from the iHeart Pluto uh, webpage. Um, so those things are all going on. And uh, we also have, our gift shop has several specialty Pluto items and you can check those out um, at our website also. So a lot of great stuff going on with Pluto. Um, we have a lot of science programs. Uh, we've, had, we've had astronomers already. We have more coming. And um, with Dr. Will Grundy here from Lowell. Um, we have artists. We have um, astronauts, uh, um, Ron Guerin and Nicole Stott, who spoke earlier. And you can check out all of these programs on YouTube because once they're done, they're, they're, they stay there. So if you missed one, you can go back and see them. 
Um, so with that, um, we'll get to tonight's program. Um, it's really fun again to work at Loeb Observatory because we have such a heritage of um, Pluto here at the observatory. Everywhere you turn around, there's a telescope dome or an apartment or this room um, is related in some way. And so um, we're gonna play the first uh, video and then this is gonna kind of, it, it kind of jumps around a little bit. Um, Ariel and Kendall um, are gonna be um, the ones hosting these sections um, and talking. And we're gonna talk about kind of setting the stage. Um, the early searches for a ninth planet um, well before Low Observatory was established, then we'll move to Low Observatory and we'll look at some of the early in instruments that were used here at the observatory for the search. Um, and then we'll also look at not only the telescopes, but the blink comparator machine, um, which is a, a device used for taking pictures in the sky and comparing these pictures and looking for planets. Um, so with that, um, let's start our first video. The hunt for Pluto didn't necessarily begin back in the 1910s or 20s when we may have believed it to begin. This search started back in the 1600s. Ever since humans had the ability to look up, we've been marveling at the night sky and we've noticed these planets, which is derived from the Greek word wanderers. We're able to see Mercury through Saturn with our naked eye in the night sky, and it wasn't until the 1600s with the popularization of the telescope where we were able to look a little further. Back in 1781, a European astronomer by the name of William Herschel discovered what is now known as our seventh planet. Initially given the charming name George and then Herschel, uh, eventually this beautiful blue ice giant was given the name Uranus after the god of the sky. Once this planet was studied for a while, scientists started noticing these abnormalities in the orbit of Uranus. This led scientists to believe that there was some other massive thing on the outskirts of our solar system. This began the hunt for the eighth planet. In 1846, a French mathematician by the name of Leverrier started developing calculations trying to predict where this hypothetical eighth planet should be purely by using mathematics alone. Around the same time, a British mathematician by the name of John Couch Adams was making similar predictions. Leverrier sent his calculations to observatories all around Europe, and Johann Gall at the Berlin Observatory gave those coordinates a look. Neptune was discovered that very same day that letter was received by both Leverrier and Adams within one degree of where it was predicted to be. To put that into perspective, a single degree in the night sky is about the width of your fingertip held at an arm's length away. So Neptune was discovered almost purely thanks to mathematics. Once scientists got to studying Neptune, they noticed even more gravitational abnormalities in its orbit. This led an American mathematician and astronomer to begin his hunt for Planet X. This man was Percival Lowell, the founder of the Lowell Observatory. Hi, we're here at the Clark Dome, built to house Percival Lowell's magnificent 24-inch refracting telescope. The 24-inch Clark refractor, which we more often simply refer to as the Clark, was built and commissioned by Percival Lowell in 1896, specifically for his studies of Mars. Percival Lowell spent hours in his observing chair, looking at the red planet and meticulously mapping what he saw. We're gonna head inside now and talk a little bit more about its use in the search for Pluto. Okay, here we are inside the Clark Dome with the 24-inch Clark Telescope. The Clark Telescope, which you see here, has been used uh, over the decades uh, for many things, including furthering our understanding of our own planetary neighborhood, as well as the very nature of the universe. Vesto Slater, who is pictured here beginning in 1912, used a spectroscope, which is an instrument that can be attached here where the eyepiece normally goes, and he used it to study galaxies, which were then not confirmed to be actually separate from our own Milky Way, and he discovered that these galaxies had an incredible redshift, meaning that they were moving away from us at great speeds. And this, uh, this data which he collected was used by Edwin Hubble to great effect, and it became the first empirical evidence that we had of the expanding universe. The telescope was also famously used in the Apollo missions, um, to do moon mapping and train NASA astronauts. And uh, a little known, albeit short, period in the Clark's life was actually as the first telescope used for the photographic search for Planet X. So uh, John Duncan was a recent graduate of Indiana College or University, and he was the first recipient of Percival Lowell's Lawrence Fellowship. And when he came to Lowell, he was tasked with finding an instrument that would be appropriate for the search for this mystery planet. So he began working with the Clark, uh, placing a, a camera down here 
where the eyepiece would normally go, um, filling it with a photographic plate, and then taking exposures of the night sky. But Zunke would soon realize that the Clark's field of view was too narrow, and its exposure times needed were too long to make it an effective instrument in the search. So the search for Pluto would go on using a suite of different telescopes. Our next stop on the tour is the Lampland Dome, named for former Lowell astronomer Carl Lampland. This dome uh, now serves as the observatory's wood shop and is more fondly known by observatory staff as the Jiffy Pop Dome uh, due to this large protruding metal structure coming out of the ground. So the building was actually constructed in 1909 by a local mason, all underground save for this dome. And it was built to house another incredible Percival Lowell purchase. Uh, in 1909, Percival Lowell contracted with Alvin and Clark and Sons again, those were the makers of the 24 inch Clark telescope, to produce a 40 inch reflecting telescope, which proved to be the biggest in Arizona for many decades. Carl Lamplin put the 40 inch reflector to good use from its construction through the late 1940s, taking over 10,000 photographic images of everything from planets to variable stars, uh, nebulae, and comets. Uh, and though his name is very little mentioned in the Pluto discovery story, he was actually an instrumental player. Lampland uh, was Percival Lowell's most trusted advisor, and he uh, was tasked in about 1912 with taking photographic images with this reflector uh, to continue the photographic search for this mystery planet. Now, Lampland had some doubts about how effective this telescope would be, noting that uh, it also had a narrow field of view, much like the Clark, but nonetheless, he spent many hours and late nights photographing the night sky in search of the mystery planet. So although the 40-inch uh, Lampland telescope turned out not to be the right instrument for the job, Carl Lampland's role in the search for Pluto didn't end. In fact, he was the one who encouraged Percival Lowell to require the best possible instruments for the work, which included the blink comparator that would be used later to uh, analyze those fateful blinks uh, in 1930 that contained Pluto. After Pluto was found in 1930, Carl Lampland continued to help uh, calculating the 248 year orbit of Pluto, as well as searching for satellites. Now today, the skeleton of the Lampland telescope, the 40 inch reflector, lies just north of our Steele Visitor Center, serving as a historic and beautiful piece of yard art. We're here just northwest of the Putnam Collection Center, which you can see behind me, up here on the Mars Hill campus. and. Uh, just to the northwest lie two telescope piers. Now these foundations, uh, these piers were used to hold other instruments that were used in the photographic search for Pluto. Um, this foundation here used to be home to a small canvas dome that was used to house a five inch telescope built by John Brashear of Pittsburgh, uh, who also constructed uh, Vesto Slifer's spectrograph. Now in 1906, John Duncan, who had been experimenting on the Clark, uh, began to look for another instrument to use and this five inch telescope uh, was put to use to take photographs. Now, he noted that the field of view was better than that of the Clark and it was overall a more suitable instrument. He was able to take three hour long exposures, which was letting him photograph objects that were well within uh, the brightness or faintness, I should say, of the theoretical planet that they were looking for. So in the end, the five inch Brashear telescope proved to be a more suitable instrument for the search than the Clark and was used as the primary instrument for several years taking photographs of the night sky. So just 50 yards to the east of the five inch pier is the nine inch pier, which from April of 1914 through July of 1916, housed a small dome with a nine inch Brashear photographic telescope. Uh, this was borrowed by Percival Lowell from John Miller, who was head of the Swarthmore College Sproul Observatory. During this time, the telescope was used to take over a thousand photographic plates covering the entirety of the invariable plane, which is the area where you might expect to find a planet. Uh, in 1916, Percival Lowell passed away and he was never awarded the satisfaction of seeing his planet X found. But in 1930, when Pluto was found in a strange uh, coincidence, the astronomers who were calculating the orbits of Pluto had reason to look back at the plates from this nine inch telescope and realize that Pluto indeed had been captured on some of these plates, faint and unnoticed. Uh, so Percival Lowell had gotten to see his planet after all. The blink comparator was a really important tool when it came to the discovery of Pluto. It used to be housed in the office right next to Clyde Pombo's office. 
The Blink comparator came along in 1912 during one of the early searches for Planet X. Discovering a planet is no easy feat, but this Blink comparator made things a lot easier. Initially, images were taken on the 5-inch and 9-inch telescopes, and back in the 1920s, when the hunch for Planet X was recommenced and Clyde Tombaugh was on board operating the 13-inch astrograph, he would take large 14 by 17-inch plates and have them analyzed in this blink comparator. Two images would be taken, about a week apart, of the exact same area of the night sky. In the Pluto Discovery plates, the star Delta Genorum was used as a bright central guide star. By putting your eye here, and by flipping this switch back and forth, it'll appear in the eyepiece as if the image is blinking. The blink comparator is flipping the view back and forth in the eyepiece in the same area of the two images, so you won't really see stars wandering around. Again, these images were only taken about a few days apart, and stars barely move relative to each other within a thousand year period. But planets are a lot closer, so their movement is a lot more noticeable. So to discover a planet, one had to analyze hundreds of thousands of dots per set of plates to see if a single dot moved. If a dot appeared to jump in the view as it's being flipped back and forth, there's a chance that that dot could be a planet, and that's how Clyde Tombaugh was able to discover Pluto. Well, there's a really great introduction to some of the early days of the search here at the observatory and some of the instruments that were used. And, you know, when we get opened up again to doing uh, tours, we're, we're you know, we'll be moving reopening phases with COVID just like everybody else. We're, we're doing it on a very um, stringent scientific basis um, in, in line with CDC recommendations. But when we get back to being able to have our guests on campus, you know, when you're walking around, you're going to see so much of this stuff and not even realize it. Um, or maybe you will now. Some of these little um, cement piers that you would think is just some leftover thing. It is. But Oh yeah, by the way, the first picture of Pluto we, here at the observatory was taken right there. So it's really neat. There's, it's like all these little secret compartments, but they're in the open. Um, you just don't realize what they are. So we'll, we'll head into our second video. Um, we've, so far we've set the stage um, and shown some of the instruments used in early searches. Now we're gonna move on a little bit. Um, first of all, talk about the end of the early searches for um, this planet X, and that is tied directly with the with the death of our founder. Um, and then we'll talk about kind of the next and final phase of the search and some of the facilities related to that. We'll talk about Clyde Tombaugh and also um, the telescope that he would ultimately use for the discovery. Um, so let's roll video two. Welcome to the Percival Lowell's Mausoleum. We're currently right here at the Mausoleum. Um, the Mausoleum sits here right nearby the Clark uh, Telescope, and then it also faces the east side of the city. Percival Lowell wrote a memoir about called the Trans-Neptunian Planet, which calculated Planet X um, based on all mathematical calculations. Unfortunately, Percival Lowell died of a stroke in 1916, which brought a stop to the second phase of the Planet X search. His widow Constance built this mausoleum for the honor of Percival Lowell's um, passion for astronomy. This, uh, this mausoleum was built until 1923, seven years after um, he passed away. This mausoleum was meant to look like a telescope dome and also Saturn with a ring going around it. During the meantime, Percival Lowell was buried in a grave nearby. Currently right behind me, we're at the edge of the Schleifer building. So back in the time, the Schleifer building was known as the Observatory of Administration's building. Right behind me, we can see where Clyde and Tomball stayed and also where he worked when he was at the observatory, where his office was on the right-hand side of me and then the apartment was right above me. So first, we got to talk about who is Clyde and Tomball. Klein Tombaugh was born in Illinois in 1906. He was the oldest of the six siblings, and also Clyde would work around and develop skills on his family farm while he was working with his father. At a young age, he developed a strong passion for reading and learning different subjects like geography and history. When he was a teenager, Klein Tombaugh developed a passion for astronomy when his uncle Lee gave him a three-inch telescope and a book about astronomy. 
With that telescope and his book that he was given from his uncle Lee, his passion for astronomy would grow and be very eye-opening to him. In 1912, uh, Klein Tomba and his family moved to Kansas and he brought the book and his telescope with him so he can view the night skies of Kansas when they were viewable and also when time allowed. And from this start, his interest in astronomy grew. In 1927, Clyde would build a seven inch reflector that would be later sold to his uncle Lee. With that money that he received from his uncle, he would later build a telescope in 1928 that would be a nine inch reflector. Later in 1928, a devastating hailstorm ruined the family farm and also devastated his chance to go to college. Clyde knew that farm life wasn't for him. In 1928, Clyde would send his observations of Jupiter and Mars to different observatories to gain experience. Um, VM Schleifer wrote to him and saying that the observatory would hire him as an astronomer's assistant. Clyde would receive that letter on January 2nd, 1929. and. He accepted the position. Two weeks later, he headed off to Flagstaff, Arizona from Kansas and headed to Lowell Observatory. And that would be the start of his astronomical career. During his time here at the observatory as the astronomer's assistant, he would shovel off snow off telescope domes and also bring in coal and wood into the main building's furnace. Also, Clyde would give um, daily tours to visitors. Star at his starting time, he would earn a monthly salary of $125. The third phase of the Planet X search started in April of 1929, which would lead to the discovery of Pluto in February 18th of 1930. Currently, we are at Klein Tombow's office. Uh, Klein Tombow used his office here at the observatory in night, starting in 1929 to search for the search of Planet X and stayed after the discovery of Pluto in 1943. Next door was the blue comparator that he would take a lot of images that he would take from the Lawrence Lowell Telescope that are known today as the Pluto Discovery Telescope. And across from his office was Carl Lightman's office, who also looked at the pictures of Pluto that same day. Also, on the day of the discovery, on February 18, 1930, Klein Tombaugh ran to B.M. Schleifer's office, who was the director at the time, and said he found the planet X. Hello and welcome to the Tomball apartment. During Klein Tomball's stay here at the observatory, Ian Schleifer wrote to him stating that there would be a room provided for him at the observatory. In this way, Clyde can save money on rent and also would be very convenient for him because a lot of his work was at night at the Lawrence Wall Telescope. After a long night of work, he can just walk down the um, walkway and rest up. Talk about a short commute. The telescope dome was located about 500 feet away from the apartment. Even though we don't know which room that Klein Tombaugh stayed in, this room was dedicated to him in 2015 for his discovery of Pluto in 1930. On a typical basis, this room is used by a visiting scientist and guest. So how far is Pluto really? Well, we know Pluto can get around three to four billion miles in its orbit. That's really far away. To help us better visualize these large distances, scientists create scale models of these objects so we can better understand it. Luckily, we have a scale model of the solar system right in front of the Pluto Discovery Telescope. So during this walk, sometimes we reminisce on how far away Clyde Tombo was actually looking when he discovered Pluto. So during this walk, every inch represents about a million miles. So here we are at the sun, and let's take a look at the inner planets of the solar system. So here we are at the inner planets of the solar system, also known as the rocky bodies. So Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are all made of rock. So technically, you can stand on them. So during the formation of our solar system, the solar system was spun out like a disc, kind of like pizza dough. When you spin pizza dough, it all gets flat. And so when that was happening, the materials were spinning so fast that the heavier things actually stayed towards the center and the lighter things can spread out towards the end and create our gas giants. So let's go check out our gas giants. So here we are at our gas giants. Jupiter and Saturn. So the further away that we walk, we'll reach Uranus and Neptune, our icy giants. 
So the reason why we call Neptune and Uranus icy giants compared to Jupiter and Saturn is because they're a lot further away. So their composition is really, really cold and a little bit different uh, than these gas giants here. And if we keep walking out towards the edge of the solar system, we'll finally reach the Kuiper belt. And that is where Pluto lives. So let's go check it out. So now we have made it to Pluto. So it took us quite a while to get here. So let's see how far back we were at the beginning. That's a long ways away. So no wonder why things out here are so cold and chilly. So Pluto is mainly made of rock and ice. So things out here in the Kuiper Belt can get a little bit different. So it took us a few minutes to walk all the way to Pluto. So how long would it take an actual spacecraft to get to Pluto? Well, we don't have to wonder about that because we actually did it. So in 2006, New Horizons, this spacecraft right here actually went to Pluto. So we launched it in 2006 and it flew past in 2015. So it took just under 10 years to get to Pluto. So here is where New Horizons is now compared to when it flew past Pluto. So New Horizons is about 5 billion miles away from the sun compared to around 3 to 4 billion miles when it passed by Pluto. So New Horizons is still flying out in the solar system today and it'll just keep going and going and going until we lose signal from it. But today we still have signal. So we have walked 5 billion miles to get to the Pluto Discovery Telescope and here we are. So a little bit about the telescope building itself. Uh, the engineers who built it were really resourceful with the materials that they used. So the rock itself was actually collected here on Mars Hill. And the dome itself is just repurposed materials that we had laying around on campus. Does the structure look a little familiar? That's because it was modeled after the Clark Telescope. Uh, if it's not broken, why fix it? All right, so let's head inside the Pluto Discovery Telescope and see what's in there. So here we are in the downstairs of the telescope dome. So today, uh, the downstairs houses a bunch of memorabilia and history about the discovery of Pluto. But back when Clyde Tomo was doing the search, this is where he would prepare the photographic glass plates to take pictures of the night sky. But what we're really interested in is upstairs. So let's head upstairs and see what we got there. So here we are in the Pluto Discovery Telescope Dome. And in this very room, 91 years ago, this is where Pluto was discovered. Well, technically this room isn't where Pluto was actually discovered, but this is the machine that did all of the work. So here we have the actual telescope or astrograph itself. And so the materials also like the outside, on the inside were repurposed materials. So the actual structure of this is built with scraps of railroad tracks. And this is actually just a piece of rolled up metal tubing that we had. And the telescope dome is built from ponderosa pine. So that is actually native to the Flagstaff area as the world's largest ponderosa pine forest. And then we also have our boxing glove here. This boxing glove was put in place so when guests and people came in here, they didn't get punched in the face by the actual telescope. And so a little, something else that is different in this room is that the floors are a lot lower. So back then, Clyde needed available access to the telescope for the photographic plates. So the floor was a little bit higher, it was about right where this concrete pillar is. But for historic purposes and tourism, the floors were lowered. So here is the actual back of the astrograph. So this telescope is called an astrograph because it can take pictures of the night sky. And so right here is where Clyde Tombaugh would put his 14 by 17 inch glass plates right here at night. And he would buckle it in and let an exposure happen. So he would let light be soaked onto these pieces of glass, and that's how he would have his picture. So that's what this part of the telescope does. 
this part of the telescope was used for kind of centering in on objects. So he knew exactly who was in the right place when taking different pictures. And so these pictures were taken days and even weeks apart in the same exact part of the sky. So the reason why Pai Tanma did that was because he wasn't looking everywhere in the sky for Pluto. He kind of knew a certain aspect of the sky where to look. And this was directed by Liam Slifer. So there's a part of the sky called the ecliptic, and that's where all the planets, the sun, and the moon orbit relative to us. So if you can find out where the ecliptic is, uh, you're likely to find a planet in the night sky. So Clyde Tomba knew to look in that certain area of the sky. So that's where he took his exposures every single night was at the ecliptic. Well, this is great. I, you know, I was just thinking, I'm, I'm hearing the wind howling outside. I don't think it's snowing tonight, but uh, the weather is really pretty yucky. And, um, you know, last year we did the first I Heart Pluto Festival and we did everything in person. Um, if we were doing that this year, I'm not sure how many people would be up here because of the weather. A couple of nights ago, it was really snowing. Um, so this is really a great opportunity um, for everybody to hear our great educators um, talk about something they're really passionate about um, and they get paid for doing it. I mean, how cool is that? And so it's nice to be able to do a tour of Lowell from the comfort of your own home without the snow coming down. Um, and, you know, it's remarkable, you know, we're talking just about Pluto tonight, and Pluto is certainly such a big part of the low observatory heritage, but we have research going on in all different aspects of, of astronomy, solar system bodies like um, moons and asteroids and comets, um, things outside of the solar system, sun-like stars, um, dwarf galaxies, um, cannibal galaxies and things like that. We have so much great research going on. We're just talking about one component of it. So um, we celebrate Pluto, um, but it, to me, it's, a, it's an example of the great science that's been done here for decades and continues to be done. Um, and so somewhere down the road when we can uh, offer uh, on-site visitations again, you can come up and learn about Pluto and certainly a lot of other things. Um, so we're ready for our, our third video. This one, you know, we, we've looked at the early searches and some of the instruments that were used. Um, Clyde Tama coming on board where he lived, uh, where he worked, it's all pretty much the same place. Um, and the last spot we're going to go to is one of the coolest rooms here at the observatory. It's down in the basement, hidden away in the catacombs of the what's called the Slifer building. And this is the plate vault. And it has tens of thousands of photographic glass plates, including one that's very special. Um, so let me turn it over to Jose, and um, she'll talk about some of the plate vault, and then kind of finish the story with the discovery of Pluto. So hi, I'm down here in the basement of the Slifer building, and we're going to go down here into the forbidden plate vault so we can learn about how Clyde discovered Pluto. So let's go on in here this way. And as you can see in here, there's just thousands of files of photographic plates and they're from all different telescopes. We have over here on the right hand side, we have our uh, 14 by 17 inch plates that were taken with our Pluto Discovery Telescope. And then we also have photographic plates, for, uh, nine inch plates and five inch plates. Uh, we have them uh, scattered all about in here from our Clark telescope and the Lamplin telescope, as well as some other astrographs that we had early on in the early searches for Planet X. Uh, so uh, over here on this side of the room, we have hundreds of plates that Clyde took all by himself, uh, just from starting up here and then ending down uh, on this third shelf here. All of these plates up here, Clyde Tombaugh took during his search for Planet X in the 1929 and 1930. And this one, this one's very special, and I'm not going to be able to pull it out because I uh, would like to keep my job uh, very much. But we can see this one was the one that was taken on January 29th. This was the second of the two photographs that he used to find Planet X. So. We're going to slide that right back on in there. 
<laughs> now, uh, just a refresher in case you missed the part where we were talking about how he was using the Blink Comparator to search for this planet. Uh, upstairs we have this Blink Comparator and you take two photographs. They were taken several days apart from each other, but they're of the exact same coordinate in the sky. And these two photographs here were incidentally of the star Delta Gemini. Now of course, not just Delta Gemini is the only star in there. There's thousands of stars in one photograph. Uh, so what uh, he would do is he would take the two photographic plates after developing them, he would put them in the blink comparator, and he would watch for motion. By flipping the pictures back and forth, he would start to look for one little dot out of a thousand that might move a tiny microscopic amount across the page or across the plate. Uh, now, the rest of the stars, they would stay still, but because he's searching for a planet, which is significantly closer to Earth than all the stars, you would actually be able to see some very minute movement over the course of several days. And so he spent nine months or so, the better part of a year, searching for this planet, this mysterious planet X, and he started searching in the constellation Gemini, where Percival had predicted this planet to be. Uh, but uh, because summer happens and Gemini goes away, he started searching elsewhere. And by the time February came around, he had photographed the, almost the entire ecliptic, uh, almost the entire sky at that point. So when Gemini came back around, he was able to continue his search in that constellation, and incidentally, he managed to find Planet X in the very same constellation that Percival had predicted. So during his search using the Blink Comparator, Clyde would go up to the office and he would scan through hundreds of these photographic plates that he took. And he would probably spend about five hours every day, every afternoon, just clicking back and forth with it, searching for the motion of this planet. And uh, after about five hours, he had to quit because he would quote unquote, his brain would turn to mush. And I relate to that on a personal level. Uh, <laughs> uh, so he would, so he would have to call it quits after some time. Finally, on February 18th, 1930, at about four o'clock in the afternoon, he found some motion on this photographic plate. He found one little dot that moved just a tiny little bit across the plates. So he, to make sure that it wasn't an asteroid, he would have to uh, measure the distance that it moved. And if it moved a big distance, then that would mean it's a lot closer to the Earth or to the Sun than if it was way out where this predicted planet ought to be. So he calculated the distance just from how much it moved. It moved about two millimeters across the photographic plate. And that was about one tenth of a degree across the sky which is a very, very small distance there. And uh, given the distance that it traveled, he was able to confirm, yeah, it's not an asteroid. It is in fact some sort of trans-Neptunian planet that they're looking for. And uh, so he had, to, he had to tell his boss. So he goes to uh, Lamplin for a Lamplin's office and he says, sir, I think I found your planet X. And so Lamplin, he had to go in and he had to also just double check Clyde's work and make sure that this planet was the planet they were looking for and not something else. Uh, they were very excited about this, as one would be. And in order to really cement that this planet's the planet you're looking for, and you want to be able to start taking observations of it immediately. You want to get its orbit and try and learn as much about it as you can. Incidentally, February 18, 1930, in Flagstaff, was a pretty cloudy night. <laughs> and that's not fun for any astronomer, when you're, especially when you're sitting on a big discovery like this one. Uh, so Clyde Tombaugh did what anybody would do after discovering a planet. He went to the movies. <laughs> and he went and saw The Virginian at our local Orpheum Theater, which is still in operation here in Flagstaff. And uh, he tried to wait out the entire night. He would check periodically to see if the clouds were clearing up and they never once let up the entire night. So he had to call it quits. So no observations were made on that night. Uh, but 
within the next coming weeks after that, they were able to take some more photographs. They had to figure out where this planet was going to be because uh, these two photographic plates that he had used to discover this planet were about a month old by now, just a little bit less than that. So they had to recalculate this new location where this planet ought to be. Then they had to photograph it. And they were trying really hard to get the schematics of its orbit so they can learn about it. They didn't announce right away that this planet was discovered because they wanted to be, they wanted to learn as much as they could. They wanted to be 100% sure. They wanted to be able to like, answer a lot of questions when those questions came. Uh, so they actually waited until March 13th, 1930, to make the official announcement of this planet's discovery. So it was a pretty special day for everyone here at Lowell and some people, and most people in astronomy. Uh, so they made this announcement on March 13th, and uh, of course it was pretty big news. And Clyde Tombaugh, he was getting all sorts of mail from his family and from fans. <laughs> across the world. There's even one uh, piece of mail that he got was someone proposing to him, <laughs> which uh, he had to decline. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, uh, the next big question, the next thing that comes after that is, what do you name this new planet that's been discovered? And so everyone around the world were sending in their ideas on what they ought to name Planet X. Uh, some of my personal favorites were Constance, after Constance Lowell, who was Percival's widow. Uh, Constance suggested that name. <laughs> uh, some people have suggested Peace. Another personal favorite was uh, a woman wanted to name it after her cat, Joaquin. And I agree with that. <laughs> uh, but the one that stuck out to everyone here at Lowell when they got some of these suggestions was a little telegram from a girl named Venetia Burney. And at the, night at the time, Venetia was around 11 years old, and she had suggested that it be named after Pluto, which is the Roman god of the underworld. Uh, because Pluto, or this planet, which will eventually be named Pluto, I suppose, was so far away from the sun that it would be cold, dark, and gloomy, just like the underworld. And everyone here at Lowell, they seemed, they really liked that idea, so we proposed this as the name for the planet, and it, that's how it got named. It was named by an 11-year-old at the time, uh, which I think is pretty neat. <laughs> and uh, so, incidentally, the symbol, the planetary symbol for the planet Pluto is a P and an L merged together, which is the first two letters of Pluto, and also Percival Lowell's initials. So that's how the planetary symbol came about. Well, what a great tour around campus. Um, we've, we've been able to see so many Pluto facilities, um, telescopes where Clyde lived um, and worked. Um, and, and this it's just really great to be able to, to um, share that. Um, we have a couple of questions. Um, that's that's the end of our of the tour. Um, we could certainly do more, but this seems like a good kind of overview of some of the Pluto related sites up here. So I'll we'll ask all of our educators to come back online. Um, and as they're doing that, um, there was one question um, asking if the old teletype machine in the background was in use still. And um, no, that's a, another artifact from a different um, project here. Um, you might have noticed that teletype was right was right next to a very large gray um, piece of metal. <laughs> it looked like something, you know, I don't know, that hasn't been used in decades, and it hasn't. Uh, that came to us in the 1950s, and that was a more quote-unquote modern blink comparator machine um, than the one that Clyde used. Um, this one um, was attached with a screen, so instead of looking through an eyepiece, um, as as you compare two plates, um, you could see it on a screen. And that um, machine was used for the proper motion survey, um, which essentially is photographing stars over time and seeing how they've changed position. So Clyde spent 14 years here. He was here a year, discovered Pluto, then spent another dozen plus years here and photographed more than 75% of the sky. 
um, years later, um, led by Henry Giclis, a team of scientists re-photographed the sky, compared these new photos to the old ones, and, um, and measured the movement of the stars. And I'll point out kind of a neat note with that. One of the main observers with that program um, was Robert Burnham Jr., who wrote the classic celestial handbook. Um, and he, used, he wrote that using pictures taken with that telescope used to discover Pluto. Um, so there's a really a, a lot of neat connections to it. Um, so let's look at a few more questions here. Um, what other name suggestions came up um, for Pluto? Um, you guys turn your sound on and you can just jump in if you like, or I can answer that. Um, Kendall, do you want to? Um, sure. Uh, so Ariel was mentioning that uh, Eureka was one of the names that came up. Do you have more on that, Ariel? Um, I just, I recall reading somewhere that someone suggested the name Eureka because you finally found it and it's like, all right, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> we tried. You know, another, there are some other suggestions. One was, um, I don't even know how you say it, Z-X-M-A-L, I think it is. And the person who suggested it said, it's the last word in the dictionary for the last word in plants or something to that effect. Um, one guy, you know, suggested a name after his daughter. Um, she may not mean much to anybody else, but she's the world to me. Um, so there's a lot of really cute suggestions that, that came out. And in fact, it's probably good to point out that um, Pluto was suggested by a lot of people. Um, Venetia Bernie was the first one to officially suggest it um, via a telegram. Um, she talked to her grandpa, her grandpa talked to a friend in England. They sent a telegram here to Lowell Observatory and that was the, the first um, piece of mail suggesting Pluto. And then there a couple dozen more people suggested that also. Um, it's kind of interesting because you can almost tell the times by some of the names that were suggested. So many people, as, as we talked about earlier, suggested peace or Pax because the 1930s were supposed to be the decade of peace, um, which started out that way, didn't end so well. Um, another name that came up a couple of times was Lindbergh. After Charles Lindbergh, who had flown across the Atlantic in 1927 and changed aviation history. So it's, it's neat to look through these letters and, and Lowell still has oh, about 250 letters and telegrams that were sent in around the world. And it's really fascinating to look through those. You see a lot of, a lot of personality and, like I said, the sign of the times that are, that are um, going on at the time. So let's um, look at a couple other questions. Um, here's one, and let's have each of you answer this. What was your first connection with Pluto? Um, I suspect for most of you it was here at Lowell Observatory, but what was your first connection to Pluto and, and how did that um, impact um, your future here at the observatory? So how about if we start with um, Ariel on that? So my first connection with Pluto, I think I remember back in 2006 when I was a wee lad, a baby, a baby crouton, if you will, I'm now a fully grown breadstick. Um, we, that was when, like, I remember seeing that Pluto was demoted and like, I always liked space and I was like, what did Pluto ever do? What did Pluto do? And like growing up, like, you know, taking the planets quiz when I was in elementary school. And if I missed Pluto, I'd get marked off. And like my younger mm -hmm. brother, if he were to take the planets quiz and include Pluto, he'd get it marked off. Like that was, that was funky to me. <laughs> Catherine, how about you? Yeah, so um, I remember in like around 2006, I was pretty young. I think a lot of us were pretty young on the educator side. And I remember when Pluto got demoted and I kind of felt like bad for it because I was like young and I felt attached to it. And then I learned about like New Horizons about it in the computer lab in elementary. And then I remember keeping up with the New Horizons ever since the mission like got launched, like keep it track where it's every, where it's going. And then I remember the day uh, in 2015 in July, I like I cut it out the newspaper that day because it was like that was the, this is the day we're at Pluto finally. And just like Pluto has been like my favorite little like celestial body out there. 
And, you know, that's interesting. It, um, before we go on, it, it gets to one of the fascinating things about Pluto is, you know, the discovery of Pluto, the search for a ninth planet, the discovery of what we know today as Pluto, and the ensuing research is, is science. But Pluto is such a part of culture and, and, and the public. Um, there's a lot of emotion with it. You know, the reclassification of Pluto, just the term that we've thrown around here a couple of times um, is demotion. Um, you know, there's nothing that says the planets are somehow better than, you know, the asteroids or the comets or anything else. It's just this impression that, you know, the mighty planets and everything else is like secondary. It, it's this personal human thing that I think makes it so interesting that it that that's why people get so still riled up about Pluto getting reclassified because, you know, it's our planet or, you know, it's the little planet that got dumped because it was too small. You know, it's just, it's just kind of comical to hear all the different um, conversations about it. So Hannah, let's go to you next. What was your first connection with Pluto? So unlike the others, my, my memory is not so good where I can remember from back in 2006, but I can remember a little bit uh, more recently in 2015 when the flyby happened and I was in high school just a year before I was going to graduate. And that's when I really started getting into astronomy and saying, hey, I want to do astronomy when I go to college. And so I was keeping up with the New Horizons mission. And I'm pretty sure at that time I was in summer school and I ditched that day just so I could like watch the news and everything that was coming in at that time. I was so excited about that. Um, so I think that was the first connection really that I had with Pluto that meant something to me. Um, you, were, and you were just into work astronomy. At you were destined to work at Lowell Observatory, it sounds like. <laughs> How about you, Kendall? Yeah. And by the way, thank you all for making me feel old that you were in high school. No. Okay. I was just going to redeem you, Kevin, because I, uh, <laughs> I actually was out of college by the time that Pluto was uh, classified as a dwarf planet. Uh, so it wasn't as impactful, you know, as a, I, I wasn't studying astronomy at the time. And, um, you know, I was like, wow, that's weird. I, you know, haven't thought about my a very excellent mother just gave us nine pickles or whatever the uh, the acronym is in a long time. But um, really, I didn't have a uh, a serious connection to Pluto until working at Lowell um, when I started learning some of the backstory and seeing the people that come to Lowell just to ask somebody there, what do you think? You know, we get so many people that want to talk to us um, and and to the astronomers who work there about you know, why, why did it get declassified and what happened? And is it a planet? Do you think it's a planet? So that's been a lot of fun because, um, you know, like Alan Stern said the other night, uh, we like to base it on a more geophysical definition, most of us here at Lowell. And so um, it's fun to talk to people about that. And uh, yeah, people get riled up about it. <laughs> I, I just have to kind of question, I don't want to question your mother, but, you know, serve nine pickles. I know, I, I guess I can't. It's nine pizzas, but it's a pizzas. <laughs> holy cow. <laughs> I'm sorry, I totally ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's, how about you? Uh, yeah, so um, I was also in high school when Pluto was reclassified as a dwarf planet. I was a junior in high school and I remember not caring at all. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I was in high school. I had more important things on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> than whether Pluto was a planet. And uh, and it probably wasn't until I actually started working here at Lowell back in 2015. This was, I started working at Lowell after the New Horizons flyby. And uh, I remember the flyby, there was like the news and I was really excited about it and all the comics and memes that were coming out regarding uh, Pluto and its little heart. And uh, um, we used to do this talk um, that we would give to the public called the... Um, the year of Pluto, because we were celebrating the hashtag year of Pluto back then. And uh, there, there, so we had this talk all about the year of Pluto. And as time went on, as we kept learning more about Pluto from New Horizons data, the talk just got longer and longer to the point where it was like an hour and a half long. And uh, that was like the first seven o'clock science talk that I gave. And I absolutely loved that talk. And I still volunteer to do that every time we do like a Pluto seven o'clock science talk. I'm like, pick me. Um, it definitely was kind of what 
it was it's just a nice talk it's a great story that's being told all all the way from like ancient astronomy until 2015 anyway um, so Josie, it, it sounds to me i'm not going to say that your job relies on this but it sounds like you now are in <laughs> pluto um more than you were in high school Is that uh, right? yeah. <laughs> i definitely i definitely became more interested in it after i started studying astronomy and started working at Lowell. Uh -huh. well here's a question from dan o'hara um and i can take this briefly what research is happening at Lowell now um, we've got about 15 astronomers here, and I say about um, because we have tenure-track PhD astronomers, but we also have postdocs and research assistants and others, and so, um, so the number is in, in that range. But, um, you know, they're doing research from solar system bodies like um, asteroids and comets and, and, and Pluto, Will Grundy, um, is on the New Horizons team. In fact, he's the surface composition team leader. Um, and he'll be speaking with us on another night about um, what we know of Pluto, what we've learned since New Horizons. Um, so there's a lot of solar system research going on. Also stuff outside of the solar system. Um, the sun and sun-like stars, um, dwarf galaxies, um, planets around other stars, exoplanets. So there's a lot of different research going on um, and one of the great things about Lowell is we're not only doing this research, but sharing the results um, with our guests. Um, right now, we've been doing a lot of that um, with um, our virtual programs, but to be able to, to do that in person is, is a lot of fun also. And, you know, there's just so much research going on here that we can talk about. Amanda Bosch, um, she was involved with the discovery of um, Pluto's atmosphere, as were some of our other astronomers like Larry Wasserman. Um, she's now running some of our technical facilities here. Um, uh, Jeff Hall, our director, um, you know, I'm not sure how much research Jeff does now because he's doing so much administration and, and especially during these tough times doing a just remarkable job of keeping the observatory um, going in a positive direction. But Jeff is part of this long-term survey of the sun and sun-like stars. Um, and so there's really a lot of really great um, astronomy research going on. And, and educators like, like um, everybody we have here tonight that shares that passion, that excitement. And as we heard about in an earlier session, the, the awe and wonder of space. Um, you know, you don't, you don't need to do research to look up and just be marveled by what's, what's up there. Um, so we have question, time for one more question. Um, we'll pass this around, we'll just uh, be brief, but our friend Jeff Gagne wants to know, um, after we've done this tour tonight of, of um, the campus focused on Pluto stuff, Jeff wants to know, um, what's your favorite part of the Lowell campus? And so we'll pose that to each of you, then we'll end our program for the night. So let's go in reverse order. Joe, so you can go first this time. Sorry, I don't know why it wasn't unmuting for a second there. Um, yeah, so I think I think my favorite, I had to think about this. Um, I was like trying to think about this answer and I think that I've come to the conclusion that my favorite spot on the whole campus is actually the um, our McAllister Dome, um, which now ho hosts our um, Dyer telescope, which is one of the newest telescopes that we have. I definitely enjoyed when, when we were doing in-person uh, outreach. I enjoyed being up at the McAllister Dome. Um, even though it was the coldest place on campus during the winter time, uh, <laughs> I, I really liked operating that telescope. It, it was running on like this old DOS system that Larry Wasserman wrote. And uh, uh, with our new Dyer telescope, I get to play with that pretty frequently now with our PA, our premium access programs and uh, I still really like it up there. And also the best view in the uh, city is right up by the McAllister Dome. Um, yep. and, like look over Route 66 and you can see uh, some downtown Flagstaff. And how about you? I'm gonna go with the Rotunda uh, Museum. I really love standing in the middle of the rounded building that used to be a library and looking up at all the books uh, that were Percival Lowell's and others um, around the edges there. And then, 
uh, the Saturn chandelier on the ceiling, just uh, oh, that's classic. pretty yeah. magnificent. Yeah, I'd say that's my favorite. Hannah? I think my favorite part on campus is the Pickard Grove. I really like it out there. It's just in between the Slifer building and the visitor center. You can see like all the nature, all the animals, all the flowers and trees. Um, Percival Lowell, he was also really interested in botany. Um, and I kind of am too. So it's nice to have that mix of, you know, natural sciences and astronomy and space sciences and stuff like that. So I think that's my, my favorite part of campus. It's super peaceful. Sure. How about you, Catherine? Um, one of my favorite areas is um, actually the outlook, like right next to the Clark, what Joseph is saying, because it has such a beautiful view of the city. And also the, you can see the Clark, like from downtown in like certain areas of Flagstaff and be like, hey, that's that Lowell. Mm -hmm. Ariel? Um, on the, or like to the right of the Pluto walkway, like as you're walking to the Pluto dome, there's a little bench um and the bench it's it's kind of like another overlook like the like the overlook next to the clark but uh it's an overlook where you can kind of see the mountain to the left then you can see the whole city and usually not a ton of people are over there so i like i like that little bench i think it's nice and i like how you've together collectively painted a picture of, of what low observatory is this tranquil peaceful exciting exhilarating inspiring place and it means something different for all of us, and yet it means the same thing, a place where we come, where we all work, um, but a place that's also, you know, is good for the soul. And whether you're getting paid or you're just coming up here to visit, it's a great place to be. Um, our, our time is up, but we have one more question that I, I'd like to get to because, um, because this, you know, one of our goals here is to inspire um, young people. And I'll, and I'll pass this on to Joe's. Um, and this is a question from Destiny. What courses would you recommend for aspiring astronomers to take should you wish to pursue a career in astronomy? Uh, yeah, so any one of us here can answer this question pretty easily. We've all, we are all studied or are studying astronomy right now. And uh, if you want to get a head up or leg up or whatever, uh, math. You really want to study math and uh, and and math, I studied math before I studied astronomy. It was actually my favorite subject in school. <laughs> so if you really, you wanna get, you wanna get good at math, especially, and physics, obviously. Um, start learning the Newtonian physics early on. And um, yeah, so that's, that's what I have to say. And I know that some other people have some stuff they wanna answer with. Okay, well, I think we're gonna, we're gonna end it there, but that's a great, you know, that's a great basic um, type of stuff that you do need to study. I'd like to thank all of our educators, Catherine, Jose, Hannah, Ariel, Kendall, for joining us tonight. And thanks to our technical team, um, Danielle and Richard and Heather for keeping everything going. Um, Rezi put together our um, videos tonight, who is also in the education program. So thanks for everybody and thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, until next time, um, have a great night and keep looking up. <laughs>